today comes from the prophet Jeremiah, the 31st chapter, verses 27 through 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of humans and the seed of animals. And just as I have watched over them, to pluck up and break down, to overthrow, destroy, and bring evil. So I will watch over them to build and to plant, says the Lord. In those days they shall no longer say, the parents have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. But all shall die for their own sins. The teeth of everyone who eats sour grapes shall be set on edge. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another, or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. And then our gospel passage comes from the gospel according to John, the 12th chapter, verses 20 through 36. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival, this is the festival of the Passover. Among those who went up to, the, to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and they said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life will lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading of his holy word. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts 
be acceptable in God's sight. For God surely is our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When I'm driving up to Piedmont from Winchester, many, many times I have my CDs playing, some of my praise songs that I've downloaded off of iTunes. And one of my favorite ones that I listen to is called Glorify Your Name. And it goes like this. I'm not going to try to sing it. Father, we love you. We worship, we adore you. Glorify your name in all the earth. Glorify your name, glorify your name. Glorify your name in all the earth. I kind of get a chill running up and down my spine when that song comes on and it's sung because it is so wonderful to be able to praise God, especially in a lovely springtime like this as I'm driving up the road looking at all the red bud along the edges. And to lift to God a song that I just feel like I cannot keep to myself. Glorify your name. Well, what exactly does this mean? And what does it mean for us as we approach Holy Week? Is there something that we can do to make this song a reality? Glorify your name. In our scripture today, Jesus explains what this means by telling his disciples a parable. And the parable comes at a very odd time. The passage begins with Andrew and Philip telling Jesus about some Greeks who had come to see him. Now, it was a fairly common request. Travelers from all over the world, you know, went through Jerusalem especially at Passover time, thousands of people, and many of them came in search of this man, Jesus, that they had heard about. At first, it seems like Jesus is ignoring Andrew and Philip's request. But then he responds to them all. But he responds with talk about glorification and seeds. What a very strange response to these Greeks that had come such a long way to see him. Well, something that will help us here is an understanding of Greek culture and religion. The Greeks and the Greek philosophers thought that the way to God and God's glory was through wisdom and knowledge. So they were always searching for kind of a higher knowledge about things, more information about God. And they traveled far and wide to find the secret to this perfect spiritual life. They thought that it was possible to attain such a level of knowledge that they could eventually become one with God. This sort of religion was called Gnosticism. I'm sure you've heard in your uh, Bible studies or Sunday school studies about the Gnostics. And that is what these Greeks were. But Jesus tells the Greeks and the disciples, that the way to God and his glory is not the upward bound path of more knowledge, but rather the way to God is the downward bound way of a grain of wheat. It must fall into the soil and die, and only then can it produce fruit. The Greek way is up and up and up, but in the end, not much 
is accomplished. God's design is down through death and rebirth and new life. In telling this parable about the law of the sea, Jesus is correcting not only the Greeks, but the Jews around him as well. Many of the Jews and even some of the disciples thought that God would be glorified if Jesus was made a king. If Jesus accepted an earthly crown and an earthly throne and then brought together a great army and chased the Romans out of the Jewish homeland, the Israel, Israelite realm. But God is not glorified by battle, nor by a Jewish-controlled Palestine area. God is glorified only through the law of the sea. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. You see, the glory of a farmer or of a gardener lies in the harvest. And so does the glory of God. But before the harvest can come about, seeds must first be planted and die. We know that seeds don't really die. What does happen is that the outer husk falls away and begins to rot, almost like a death. The kernel of wheat, which is kept inside a silo or a granary, doesn't multiply. It's unfruitful. It can be ground up and baked into flour and made into flour and baked into bread, but that is not what Jesus wants to highlight. The point is, as he said, it can multiply only if it dies as a seed. In the same way, a farmer knows that one seed planted well can produce many, many beautiful tomatoes, or pumpkins, or beans, or zucchini. But first, the seed must die. Of course, in his parable, Jesus is not only talking about the seed here. His concern is with kernels of wheat and seeds of flowers, but also he is talking about himself. Like a seed, Jesus knows that he must, too, be planted in the earth. Like a seed, he must be dead and buried before new life can come. Which means that for us, Good Friday, the crucifixion, Jesus' death and burial, follows God's law of the seed. You see, Jesus knew there could be no glory, no glorious rising anew unless he himself died and was planted in the earth. Many of us think of Holy Week with its focus on crucifixion as being very dark and very somber. And it is sad, but it is not all gloom and doom. Why? Because Jesus was the seed of a victory that was planted for each one of us. In his rising, he glorified God by overcoming death once and for all. We know this road to glorify the Father was not easy for Jesus to travel. There was great suffering and great anguish. Or how does Jesus put it? Now my heart is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? His words reflect a natural human shrinking from any kind of thought about death. 
the coming horror of the cross, which he knows, fills him with dread and with agony. The thought of bearing the weight of all human sin and evil is almost too much for him to bear. But as quickly as he thinks this, he dismisses it. And he says, no, it was for this very reason that I came to the hour. You see, he knew that he came to live out among us the law of the sea. He came to suffer and die. He came to be planted in the earth. As Isaiah puts it in one of his suffering servant songs, surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. But this was not forced upon him. He chose this path of his own free will. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, Jesus says, but I lay it down of my own accord. <clears throat> Pastor and author William Barclay tells a story of a young French soldier who was very seriously wounded in the First World War. His arm was so badly smashed that it had to be amputated. There wasn't modern technology back then. And that was the way that surgeons had to deal with life-threatening in injuries. Now this young man was in the prime of young adulthood. He was a magnificent, magnificently built young man. And the surgeon was very grieved that he had to go through the rest of his life made in this way. So he waited by his bedside to tell him the bad news when the young man recovered consciousness. When his eyes opened, the surgeon said to him, I am sorry to tell you that you have lost your arm. Sir, the young man said, I did not lose it. I gave it for the glory of France. Jesus lets the disciples know that he is not helplessly caught up in a mesh of circumstances from which he cannot break through free. He could have turned back and saved his life, but he gave it freely. The cross was not thrust upon him. He willingly accepted his role as the seed that would bring glory to the Father and life for us. And the same law of the seed that applies to Jesus applies to us. In our lives, God is glorified when a harvest of life comes from death. How does God reap a harvest in you and in me? Remember that apart from Christ and Christ's saving grace, we walk and we live in the darkness of this broken world. Our sin separates us from God, and we walk the way of, not of life, but of death. Like the seed, we must die to the sin and to our old ways, to follow Jesus and God by grace takes us from death to life. We die with Jesus, you see, and rise with him to new life. All those who believe God by grace reaps a harvest of souls. Father, glorify your name in all the earth. The Father is glorified every time that someone dead in sin comes alive again by hearing about Jesus Christ and Jesus' love and sacrifice for us. Especially when that person embodies the law of the seed willingly, willingly, choosing to die to self 
and become a new person in Christ Jesus. Jesus is clear about this. The, law, the man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Life in the kingdom of God follows the law of the sea. It is by giving, giving up, dying, that a man receives. And it is by blessing that a person is blessed. It is by dying that we live. In this, the Father is glorified. Do you remember a while back, we used to all have our cars inspected every six months, and they put a new sticker on the windshield? Some of the stickers, and I remember vaguely seeing this, some of them used to have printed on the back this slogan, which was also repeated on television. Drive carefully. The life you say may be your own. Well, that is the wisdom of men. That is not the law of the seed. What God says, on the other hand, is the life you say is the one that you willingly lose. In other words, the life you clutch, hold on to, play safe with, is in the end not going to sprout. It is worth little to anybody, including yourself. Only a life that is given away for love's sake is a life worth living. <clears throat> a life that brings glory to the Father is one that follows the law of the seed. Dying to self and living for God and for others. Father, glorify your name in all the earth. If we really mean these words, then we must give up our life, our all, for God. We must serve God, glorify God only when we die to self and live for him and him alone. Only when we want God as much as we want each breath of fresh air that we can. Jesus teaches us the law of the sea and lives it out. Are we willing to live it out as well? For the one who is our life our breath, and our all. Thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord.